kindness, people and places, sincerity, love, integrity, the incredible universe. You're listening to the Living Out Loud podcast with Natasha Moy and Dr. Vincent, where we talk about life, love and the universe. You're listening to the Living Out Loud podcast with Natasha Moy and Dr. Vincent, where we talk about life, love, and the universe. Today, we have an extraordinary guest. We have someone who I looked at in terms of a a whole picture and decided that the one word that suits this fantastic woman is actually activist of all the things that I wanted to introduce her as. But I want to call you Susan the whole time because I'm so comfortable with the idea of Susan, but it's Suzanne. It's Suzanne Gervais, which is, as you said, you're not as famous, but I think you may be. So Suzanne Gervais is an, is a published author. She is in, an, she's been awarded an OAM. She is a media personality, a brilliant author, an activist. Um, the list I think goes on, but mostly you are also, I would say an activist and an educator is predominantly what I would say. How, how am I going with this list of things? Well, I think I'm feeling very tall. It's so grand and great. <laughs> but, you know, I, I had a look at what you've been doing over your lifetime, and it's fairly extraordinary. You know, you came as the child of immigrant parents, parents who couldn't even speak English when they landed up in Australia, who worked in factories, you know, who believed that hard work would result in an amazing life. Something I think we've all lost the ability to understand that hard work results in success rather than just grabbing it. And you have become active in the education of children predominantly around the idea of bullying, growth, acceptance, and ultimately love. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about just the way you grew up. Did you experience bullying as a child? Look, as a child of immigrants, refugees, I did experience bullying because I was in a world that was so different to so many of the other kids. Like they wanted to talk about you know, netball and Vegemite sandwiches. And I was dealing with a family where my parents worked double jobs. They tried to cope with the memories of war and the struggles of becoming Australian, one of their great dreams, of course. And um, it was like being different, but no one actually saw it, except I knew it. Did you find friends easily when you were a child? Did you have a good social group? Were you, how, how was your school experience? Look, my school experience was pretty good, except I was expelled from school at five. But <laughs> how does that happen? I can't believe it. My poor parents, I went to school and straight away they were speaking in a way that I did not understand. So I quickly ran away, but they quickly found me. But the real thing is my parents were called into the school. My poor parents who spoke English hardly, they spoke Hungarian. Well, really they spoke Hunglish, something that was understandable only to them. And they were called in You understand, poor old, my poor parents, they were called in to explain that I, their daughter, was unfortunately rather stupid. And that's true. My father said, but she's not. And my mother, she started to cry. That was sort of her modus operatus, operandus. So my father said, no, she's not. And so, of course, because my parents spoke with such thick accents, the principal spoke louder. Because when you speak with a accent, they think you're deaf. And they or explain, stupid. Or stupid. And they explained to them, no, I'm very, very, very backward. And that I needed to repeat kindergarten. And I did. 
no. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to laugh, but it was. It is so funny. And I just, it was that the world was alien to me. It was alien. And at that time, Australia, which my parents were so grateful to come here, believe me, every day. My father, who worked in the Holden's car factory, and he used to be a farmer and own his land. My mother, who was the daughter of a professor of engineering who worked in a factory now, they were grateful every day because no one was going to kill them. No one would take away their family and livelihood. So they really were deeply Australian. But when they went into the school, this was a very Anglo school. And they didn't know who these foreign people were with their strange accents and their great emotional reactions. And as a result, it felt like I was living in two worlds, a world that came from war-torn Europe with incredible you know, pain and history to someone who lived in this world which was filled with um, white bread sandwiches and love people. those white bread sandwiches. Curious, oh, yeah. Dr. Vincent, you came over to university from Indonesia, obviously also with relatively thick accent and with a cultural, having been raised culturally very different to the people that you would experience. Australia and the education system is is quite inclusive. Did you feel was it difficult for you? It was, it was and it was not because I, a lot of people, including uh, my close friends and families back home, always ask me, even until today, if I find Australia or Australians racist. And my, my, my constantly, my answer to them is that I have experienced more racism back home being Chinese Indonesian compared to here being an Asian Australian. And I really do believe that Perhaps if you dissect and go into details and really go through it with a uh, fine tooth comb, yes, there are some unconscious bias or unconscious racism or casual racism that I probably have faced uh, since I came here as a student back in 2008. However, I don't, I never, at least in my case, I never felt that it was, it was, it was mean or it was intentional. And I, I value that experience as being so I'm kind of an outsider, not only looking into, but being in the community. As a matter of fact, I actually felt that, I just had this conversation last week. I actually felt that in, in a few cases, I benefit from being different because a lot of times people only focus on negative discrimination. Whereas I think there is such thing uh, that we should call positive discrimination in the way that, uh, I think I have been given a lot of opportunity because perhaps I didn't speak English that well. So they thought that maybe if you, if we send you to conferences and we sort of kind of put you uh, in the spotlight you where you have to speak English to help me out. And not a lot of people receive that kind of opportunity. Don't worry. I'm South African originally. My father's Australian and everybody hates us. I mean, I, I was with somebody today who was telling me how much they don't like South Africans. Who's a friend of mine and standing right next to me. It seems like it seems to be okay to tell South Africans that they're awful people. Um, and, and we just seem to cop it. You know, we just, we're so, I think we feel so guilty about everything that ever happened. That if you, you know, if you happen to be a white South African, God forbid, you are literally willing to just be flogged by everyone and anyone and just accept. But the reason I'm asking the two of you this question is because obviously we're going to talk about your books. And the I Am Jack um, series is based on your son who was bullied. I have a son who experienced some bullying at school. I, am, I experienced bullying at school and I understood bullying to be, to some degree, a rite of passage of life. You know, in life, bullying seems to be part and parcel. And Susan, you, you are an expert on bullying. What do you think about that? I think bullying is power abuse. There's a very big difference between teasing and bullying. Okay. Teasing, yeah, and teasing is normal. You 
know, people may upset you or insult you, but you don't lose your sense of identity. Bullying is very different. It is about social isolation. It's about eradicating your sense of self and becoming powerless. And bullying is a complete no. It is the basis of genocide. Okay. Really, it's the basis of all abuse. So I have to say that bullying is completely unacceptable as long as we don't misunderstand teasing or the to and fro of arguments, that's normal. Getting hurt, that's normal. But when you lose yourself, that makes you powerless and you cannot be all you can be. And, you know, in Australia, we have the highest youth male suicide. Mm. And, really, and really, that is about, especially boys, but girls as well, feeling persecuted, unable to speak, feeling there is no way forward, being, and they take their lives. And the reality is young people are really smart, but they're different to adults. They don't have experience. They don't realise that life is filled with obstacles and you have to climb that mountain and there'll be hope on the other side. For young people, you know, if their friends betray them, their girlfriend or boyfriend leaves them, um, terrible things are said about them, or their parent, they don't meet their parents' expectations. They feel there is no way out. So I write for those kids because there is a way out. And I want to, through story, give them the tools, the experience that they can navigate the ways through those troubles because their life is valuable and they lose it. So basically you're drawing the line between teasing and, 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 and bullying to, to, to the action. If the action shook the core of your being, then that is something that, that is considered bullying. Whereas if we are talk, if we are basically playing around and, and make a mean, probably mean comments about things and everything, that's probably something that I think people at the work, adults at workplace uh, are doing it. Kids at school and the playground are doing it, but you're drawing the line where it actually attacks the identity of that person. And really, bullying is always about isolation. It's about making that person feel alone and be alone, making that person unpopular. You're not allowed to be friendly with that person, even if you may like them. In the end, it becomes you, a tiny, powerless person against a bigger power. And it destroys you. It destroys kids. It destroys adults. What do you think makes someone a bully? Because a lot of times I believe this. I believe this having been in the position of a bully and being bullied. Mm -hmm. I don't think any kid would, would start out wanting to achieve that kind of extreme effect over someone. But how did they start? What, what, what started that? All right. One of the things you've just brought up, which is 100% true, I speak to thousands and thousands of kids and, you know, I bring up the issue of bullying and lots of kids say this happens, that happens, and they've been bullied and they've been destroyed. And ask the kids to put up their hand and, you know, the majority of kids will put up their hand that they've felt alone and frightened and so on. Then I ask the kids, now this is only for the brave. How many of you kids have bullied someone else? And half the kids will put up their hand. Bullies are not evil monsters. What happens is... Bullying is about, especially for young people, their lack of empathy. They have no experience. They look at the world from their perspective. Often when they're destroying a child, like my son Jack or others, they're not really wanting Jack to not want to live, to cry, to not want to go on with his life. They're talking about themselves. 
They feel great. All the kids are following them. They are leading. It's so much fun. Often they do it because it is fun and they can hear that child squeal or that adult run. It's a game because they have not developed empathy yet. How about they, survival? Because sorry. some people, when I, how about survival as a reason? Because the reason why I said that having been a bully and having been bullied, the reason why I, I, I would consider it a retali retaliation because uh, being, I used to be, I don't think we're allowed to use this word anymore, but I used to be fat growing up. And, I use that um, word all the time. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that's, the new, no, that's the new F word. You can't use it anymore. I was nice. told that. So coming from a place of being overweight, I think uh, going into new school, I was a perfect target for uh, bullying. Yes. And I can't remember who told me what, uh, but basically when I then go into a new environment, still fat, I decided that, okay, I would find the biggest bully bully the bully and i would be safe for six years well can i say everyone develops their own strategies one of the common qualities of all kids who are bullied is not because you're fat or thin or dumb or bright it's vulnerability kids who are bullied are often very sensitive and vulnerable so you can find another kid who is double your size, triple your size, and they call him fatty, and he laughs his head off, he's not gonna be bullied. But when you get a kid who's got this core of vulnerability, it cuts them to the soul, to the core. So it is dependent on the child. The common quality of all kids who are bullied is sensitivity, and you know what the irony is that sensibility sensitivity and vulnerability make them beautiful adults if they can survive childhood absolutely but they, but they need very tools. Grim, isn't it if they can survive childhood if they can survive childhood and they need tools and we as adults can help them with those tools to manage that you know that drama of growing up which it can be very, very difficult. I have um, I have a 15 year old. I have two boys who live with me, my own son and a friend's son. And my son's 15 and the other child is 15 as well. They have- I'm moving into- Are you moving into? Okay, but yes. you're not 15, you look 15. <laughs> so my son, interestingly enough, really struggles with the empathy. Like he's at, at this year, this year specifically, I think we have a missing empathy chip, which I find quite difficult to deal with as a parent who has extreme yeah. empathy and really feels highly sensitive about most things. The other child has more empathy and, and, and deals with it in a very different way. And I yeah. watch the interactions between them and you look at, you know, one who behaves more like an alpha male and the other who behaves more like a beta male, you know, there's yeah. different ways of dealing with it. And I think, it's fascinating to look at. My son has experienced in the past some, some forms of bullying at school. And yeah. we've had to deal with that. And when he's come to me and said, you know, this is what's happening after a very long period of time, yeah. I've had to then give advice about how we're now going to go forward. My advice is probably not necessarily the advice somebody like you might give. I, 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 I tend to be a fight fire with fire kind of person. Um, mm -hmm. And I think everyone deals with it. But when you have a child that's being bullied, um, and obviously at a younger age, you have a, a, have a situation and say an older age, you've got a junior school and then high school. How do yeah. you recommend that parents deal with, you know, a junior school child and a senior school child? Well, my advice is always to get the kids before they get to high school, when the hormones, you know, kick in and vulnerabilities are so intense when they're searching for identity and dealing with sexuality and just so much peer group pressure. If you can get the kids before they leave primary school, you can arm them for teenage years. And you might say, well, every child is different, but the way you arm them is as a parent, do really practical things. You ensure 
they have a good friendship group because you know what kids who get bullied are isolated if they've got their mates they're not going to be alone it will make it easier to challenge the kids who are going to target them that's the first thing and also kids who bully never bully someone more powerful than themselves so if you've got a group of friends you're already too powerful to be targeted or if you're targeted it's easy to knock them off so Suzanne, you were mentioning about how we arm our kids before they get to the teenage year before the senior years senior school year and uh basically by letting them know that there is a power in being with friends uh okay. developing a circle of friends but i to to play devil's advocate mm -hmm. this kind of attitude or this kind of tendency of having a tribal attitude mm -hmm. while it's probably good to protect you from being bullied but the same attitude in the work in workplace having been subjected to that it actually don't you think it creates the exclusivity that then they will then carry into adulthood which not necessarily is a good thing no look it's not setting up a tribal war what it is is making sure kids who target you or adults who target you you're not defenseless you need a mate to say cut it out you need someone other than yourself to say that's no that's no go it's not to really have two groups fighting it's to someone to have your back and you know what if you're the kid who's vulnerable you should have the back of your friends too that's all it is it's you know it's all very well to say stand up when you're being persecuted if you're by yourself you cannot you need someone to say cut it out at the beginning before it gets out of control so it's more that look the other thing parents should do and i know good parents do is to develop the interest of that child so they get a natural group based on common interests so if your child is a chess player a nerd who cares other chess players become his great mate or if they're soccer players or if they like drama or photography or collecting stamps i don't care what you need is a group of kids who have even one friend too who develop a common interest and bond and that strengthens them against bullying because bullying is never about what that child is it's what we call targeting them. So if the child is a stamp collector, that's a good thing to criticize. But if they're a soccer player, that's a good, it doesn't matter. It is just power abuse. And when you've got power abuse, the big thing is for parents to do is ensure that someone's on your team and it gives you a voice. That's the first thing. The second thing is, the adults are very, very busy and they love their children. But the reality is we're adults, which means that we never listen to our children, especially when they're young, they're so annoying. So it's true. So we might be doing something like you're working, you're coming home, making dinner, you're in a state of panic and your child wants to speak to you about some drama, maybe bullying and he says mom mom can i talk to you and i look at that child and i say can you see i have been working all day i'm coming home making dinner can you help me and not annoy me now my children are the center of my life i do not mean for my child to think i do not love him kids have no idea about adult worlds they don't know that there is a time and place for them to talk about what's important and preparing them and parents. So when I ask kids, when should you tell your parents about something important, being bullied or being upset at school or whatever? Most kids say, when my parents are doing nothing, they have no, and I say to them, 
your parents are always doing something. Don't, but they don't know that. They actually don't. But so, do you think that is one of the signs of a personality that... So, I, 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 please do not hate me for saying this, but isn't that one of the personality that got them being bullied in the first place? Because I think you were saying that people who are sensitive or kids who are sensitive are more vulnerable to being bullied. But yes. isn't there also a sort of kind of type of personality that make that makes someone more prone towards being bullied? One of the example is not being able to speak up. Yes, but we as parents, whatever your child is, we as parents have to make a safe place for them to talk. So you could be a parent who says, a story to the children at night or say good night to them. It's a time when you and your child are talking. That is a great time. You're focused on them and it's a safe place and that encourages opening up discussion. So the thing is, you as an adult, we're busy. We have to make a safe place for our children to know they can speak to us and we can hear and respond. That's the first, that's really important. Kids don't know that. The other thing that we have to, that we do is a lot of schools, teachers, parents, wisdom, you know, wisdom sayers, they say, you know, this is what bullying is. And you need to stand up if you see bullying occur. And I feel like saying, oh my God, do you want those children to die? The, honestly, have you ever heard anything so cruel? The fact is I say, I'm in work and I see something horrible happen. Now, I can stand up by myself and say, stop, so I can be fired. So the thing is, with children, you say stand up. The word that's missing is safely. And the way you stand up safely, for example, and I write about this in my books, so the kids really relate. So they see Jack being bullied in class, doesn't matter how, and the teacher doesn't know. The teacher turns around and sees Jack in trouble on the floor, with a riot and he says to Jack, Jack, I'm sick of you, you're always making trouble. The kids in the class have seen that Jack didn't make that trouble. He was pushed to the ground by the kid bullying him. And there were a whole lot of kids having a great time laughing because they were so grateful it wasn't them on the floor. Now, the advice is, you kids who saw it, stand up and say, it wasn't Jack and explain the whole situation. I asked the kids, would you do that? And I asked them honestly, would you be scared? And they said, yes, we'd be scared. Why would you be scared? Well, I'd be the next one being pushed off the chair. I'm frightened. I said, okay, let's work out how to do this safely. And then they work it out themselves. Initially, kids will say to me things, Call the police. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I said, good idea, not. So eventually we were. Well, I'm glad at least that they think calling the police is a safe call. It's a safe call, but it's not realistic in their life. So I say to them, when everyone is out of the class and your teacher is by themselves, you go with a group of friends and you say to the teacher quietly and safely, Sir, Miss. Jack's in trouble. You're safe. You're telling with a group of people. The teacher believes you because there's a group of you. And then you empower the teacher to act for justice and help that child. The point is, you do have to stand up, but only where it comes to an outcome that is safe for you and leads to a result that will help that child in trouble. And teachers will act, you know, if they are approached correctly. Fair enough. So yeah. one, one of the things I wanted to ask you, you know, uh, uh, and 
I'm sorry, did I catch, did I cut off the, was there a third point no. to this? Okay, good. Um, good. One of the ways that you educate and is, is through your books. So, you know, you are a, a celebrated and an award-winning author. You've written brilliant books. Your books are used in schools. They have been converted to Braille. You know, they are used all over in different, in different organizations. You, you are highly respected in this area. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously have done a huge amounts of research. I'm curious about reading. I'm curious about what books mean to our children who are so technology orientated. My son today sent me a message from school and said, do you have an Audible account? You know, yeah. which I thought was really interesting. Yeah. So yeah. where do you feel that reading is going for our youth and where are books in our future? Firstly, it's very important not to confuse methods of delivery and books. You know, when your son says he wants Audible, he is reading a book, you know, or listening or doing reading it on Kindle or whatever. It's fine. So let's not confuse the pencil with the writing, okay. the delivery with the story. Now, story especially for our kids before high school, especially those kids, the research has shown they much prefer a physical book. Okay. They do. And Me too. You too. I too as well. I'm and technology all the way. And that's fine too. There is um, an R in reading every page. There is a tactile. When they're very young children, of course, they don't, they respond to books very well. Picture books are not easily translatable to digital because there's a whole lot of other developmental things happening. Mm. But the thing with story is that young people read very differently to us. When a book is important to them, they will reread it 10 times, 20 times. We as adults do not. We might read it a second time, maybe, but ultimately we don't. Children and teenagers, they read and reread books because they're searching for values. They don't know that. They're searching to identify with the characters, to empower them when they feel disempowered, to when they feel abandoned by friends. They go into a book and there is a friend. They're not alone. So books become confidants. Okay. Not, and they, the main thing is they select their friends. They select their books. And when the book speaks to them, you'll see them turn to the same chapter again and again because they don't know why. I remember um, a mother of a little girl who had gone through a horrible divorce and she said, I don't know why, but your book is next to that girl, that nine-year-old girl's bed. She needs it next to her bed. And the reason is it gave her comfort and succor when adults destroy their lives. Because one of the things with children, when adults do have arguments and conflicts, you know, we are what we are, children are the silent participants in that, except they have no voice. Okay. So we need, through story, to give them a voice so that they can move forward and not like children also, because they're not fully developed emotionally, they believe all problems are centred on them. Their parents are arguing because they did something. If they do this, their parents will get together again. No. No, so they need the story to strengthen them. And um, this is the reason, like, I, I, this is the reason why I got so interested when I was researching about your, you and your work, because there was one interview, I think it was with ABC Radio, mm -hmm. uh, where you were asked about what was the purpose of the book, or was, it, was it for the anti-bullying movement every, uh, or, or something like that, and you actually said that it is about changing culture and empowering kids, which okay. is bullying, anti-bullying is one aspect of that, but yeah. you are, you're, 
you are your goal your purpose is much more wider and much more in terms of strengthening the kids and our young generation it's more powerful than that look i agree and it worries me when things become we're talking about anti-bullying or we're talking about disability or this or that no no we are talking about development of young people into adults with power to be all they can be we are completely dependent on our young people to have strength because when we look at a world which is obviously we're we're challenged with a pandemic and we have the black lives matters and we have war and we have genocide and we have climate challenges kids are not deaf or blind they know what's happening and it's frightening well i believe story can change that fear into action into empowerment and when we see the little Greta Thunberg that little girl who stood up and has led the world in terms of climate action you have to know that if we can strengthen young people they have ideals that you know and I think that um, I write those books one because I want to create warriors for change but two I do not want to lose children on the way by feeling less than they can be, by feeling disempowered, by not believing that they can do what they want. And I was in America actually talking to American kids and I always know when a child is in trouble because you finish your talk and there's inevitably some kid who waits to talk to me mm. and I say, okay because when I talk to them and when they read my books they think I personally know them they write to me as if I know their lives and it's part of the psychology of kids it's so beautiful so this little fellow stands next to me Suzanne I said yes can I ask you um if your you know dad works all the time um you know and you can't really afford books you know what do you do and i say oh you know go to libraries and if this child's nine or ten he said and if um you don't have a mother like you have a mother in your books and i really like the mother and I said, oh yeah it's nice this makes me sad <laughs> I started, I got two and then this little boy says, if you don't have a mother, I said, okay, well, you know, you have to be, you know, you are then, you know, got to be strong. He said, oh, but I'm so lucky. I've got a little brother who's three. I said, oh, that's wonderful. Except he's a bit crazy. <laughs> Why? Oh, mummy's not dead, but she's a heroin addict. I said, okay. And he says at the age of nine and 10, that he's the full-time carer of his three-year-old crazy little brother who he adores and his father's away. And he said, and then I said to him, because I was getting sad, I said to him, and what are you gonna do when you grow up? Now, remember he's American. Mm. He said, oh, you know, he was very upset about the Twin Towers, of course. So I'm going to be a firefighter. And then he stops and he says to me, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not going to be a firefighter. And I said, yes, you are. He said, no, I can't be anything. And I said, what? He said, no, I, I can't do anything. I won't be a firefighter. And you know what? I gave him a book and he's in America and he wanted to, correspond with me which you know is a no-go but by through the book through talking to me i then of course spoke to the librarian and i said this little fellow's in trouble and she, i bet i said to her will you refer her to the school counselor in america they have a counselor in every school so she said yes and we had a chat so i left that school feeling really sad that kids do deal with so much but his interpretation 
is that he, at the age of nine and 10, is a failure, even though he's a hero, because he's holding that family together. He's looking after his little brother. He doesn't know he is amazing. And so what you try to do within story, because so many kids have difficult lives, not, and it's not due to even affluence or not affluence, just due to human nature. You try to empower them through story and give them ways forward. Wow. So can I ask a question? Well, Natasha, you go, because I'm speechless at the moment. Um, well, I felt like I've, I've got all teary, and so I'm trying to have, yeah. I'm worried my mascara is going to run, and you know, I'm all about the way it looks, um, not, not necessarily the way it sounds. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I have a journalism degree, and so you know, writing is part of what I do, although I don't necessarily believe I'm particularly good at it. I'm much better verbally. How do you as an adult create stories for children that you are no longer connected to as a child? You are not a child. You don't feel like a child. You don't think like a child. You are not bullied like a child. I, I'm fascinated by the ability for adults to get to a level where they can communicate with a child and, and, and do it so that they said they felt like you were talking to them. How do you yeah. do that? Well, a lot of adult writers who are very brilliant like to think they can write for children because they have things to tell them. Uh, children do not like to be told, and neither do I. <laughs> the, thing is, the thing is, it's true. They've got lots of worthy things to tell them, especially if you're bullying them, or this or that, they've got to do this. The kids have no idea what you're saying, they're bored. Why can I write for children? And it is a reason that is common to many children's authors. As the child of, as a second generation child of refugees, I understood from a really early age living with that history. And my parents were so brave and I, they never spoke about their past. To, they want to protect me. But the truth is children are silent travellers in their life. And I knew everything. I didn't understand it. But one thing I knew, and it was a passion for me, that whatever challenges you will face, you have to have the courage to go forward. And it's so hard. It's so hard. So every single thing I write is, and often I write with jokes and humor and lightness, depending on the age. Everything I write is about kids having the power to not only survive, but to thrive. And it's hard. And you know what? I don't ever compromise in terms of what I write about. That does not mean profanity. That's a waste of writing space. I don't, I believe kids are super smart. And if you give them real information, they know, they know, and you empower them. So my background is why I write these books. So, you know, I wrote this beautiful book called Butterflies for young adults about growing up with third degree burns. Great topic. My publishers, HarperCollins, thought it was a really bad topic, but I was very pushy. And finally, yes, they published it. And someone said to me, oh, you must have been burnt. I wasn't burnt, but I understood adversity. And because, like a journalist, I spent a year going to burn units, looking through terrible books, speaking to survivors, speaking to parents, speaking to um, doctors, going to the Westmead Hospital, the burn unit, one of the most confronting experiences of my life. And once I put apart away the, the research, I wrote a story about us, about a 17 year old girl growing up with burns and how she emotionally deals with it and the loves and the insecurities and so on. 
And you might have said, oh, she was bullied because people called her names and she looked different. No, she wasn't. She, her self-concept was challenged. How can she be what she can be? Now, I was invited to New York to speak at the World Burn Congress about this. Wow. It was the most... Actually, when I got the invitation from New York, I checked to make sure it wasn't from Nigeria and saying, would you pay me a million dollars? <laughs> really? You thought it was a scam? No, it was real. They paid. So what happened? Them. A million dollars? <laughs> no, they didn't pay a million dollars. <laughs> no, uh, they didn't. They paid my tickets, but I was thinking it may be a hoax, you know? They sometimes trick you because I thought, why would they be asking me to go to New York? It's an Australian book. Anyway, I flew over and I was on the faculty with Kim Fook. You may not know her, but you do know her. If you remember the incredible photo, 1972, taken by Nick Ute of the little girl running from napalm in Vietnam. <laughs> How can anybody not have seen that? Uh, How can you not? That is burnt into our I, brains. I just got, you know. That is that is an image burnt into our brains. Exactly. So as soon as you mentioned that, got chilled. Wow. So I, can you imagine? I'm so humbled. So I'm going to speak and the fact includes Kim Fook. And Kim Fook had 80% of her body burnt. And I've now done all the research on burns. I know what burns are. It's endless operations and endless pain, apart from disfigurement. It's a whole lot of stuff. And this woman came onto the stage in this gorgeous royal Ada. You know, she's magnificent. She was very blessed that her beautiful face was not burnt because then it's even more challenging. She stood up and addressed us and she said, I believe that to go through this agony which she did and she was used by the communists as a anti-american poster and so on she said there had to be a point for my life which still involves suffering physically and she said it was to turn this in this burning into something that would enrich the world and she became the unesco ambassador for peace she went to arlington where she embraced the Vietnam vets in forgiveness. And do you know what? I just, I just fell at her feet. I thought, you know, that is true courage. So I had the job of talking about my butterflies to these hundreds and hundreds of people, of which some of them have no hands. Some of them look like this. Some of them very, very burnt people, <laughs> kids, families medical doctors, teachers, all sorts of amazing people, firefighters. So I'm speaking for one hour about my book and the journey and how it empowers young people. And I'm thinking there's dead silence. I'm thinking they hate me. <laughs> they hate me, not a word. And I'm thinking, oh my God, maybe they can't move. So I was, <laughs> you know, it's very stressful. But at the very end, they lined up to get my book and a girl I knew she was a girl because of her voice she was holding butterflies close to her oh. heart. and she this girl I knew I knew she was young because of her voice she'd had facial reconstruction so her face had been burnt and even with the best of surgeries you don't look like us you look different and this little girl puts her hand out to me and she says, Suzanne, I'm 15, nearly 16. Will I have a life? And I had the total privilege of saying, yes, you will, and holding her. And, you know, the power of story. And I've had so many people, kids, young people write to say, that's my story, that's my story gave them hope for the future i don't and think i've ever I'm done an interview i don't think i've ever done an interview where i wanted to cry through most of it <laughs> no I <see. laughs> and i've interviewed I'm, some I'm pretty not only misty <laughs> i've interviewed some fairly extraordinary individuals in my time but your stories and the way you tell them make my heart 
feel, you know, and, and, and they're beautiful stories. And I think you're a really beautiful woman. <laughs> I think, I think your journey has been, yeah. You can talk now, Dr. Vincent, because I want to cry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, I, I was a little bit, um, I was a little bit taken aback too, because uh, I was remembering uh, my earlier, younger years uh, being, feeling isolated and being, feeling very different, uh, feeling that I didn't really relate to uh, my friends who wants to play video games and stuff like that. And um, I, the escape was books, because yeah. I relate to characters and as yeah. much as there's a controversy now about uh, JK Rowling, but her books actually got me through my teenage years because being different and being almost out of place and awkward, it, it, all of those things do not necessarily mean that you're a failure or that you cannot achieve anything because those are probably the qualities that would actually propel you to a greater journey. Well, I believe for a lot of young people and old people, but young people particularly, books are a safe place. They're they a safe are. Place and it's their private place and no one can take it away from them. So for example, with Harry Potter, I tell kids, the kids read it. And I said, you know, they think it's about fantasy, but I said to them, no, no. It's about a complete and utter nerd, a boy who wears glasses, who lives under the stairs, and he becomes a superhero like you. And the kids get that because yeah. that's what it's about. The world is about good and evil and fighting for justice. Yeah, it that's is. What they, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna end us off now just because we've almost done an hour, which is unusual, and there, I oh. probably do three hours of this chat. There is so much still that we can touch and. Maybe we can come back and revisit some. We of the need other. to come back. We have to have an, an, an encore performance. I think we definitely do. But you know, I've been looking a lot. You know, Dr. Winston knows this. You know, I do a lot of yoga, and I'm working on trying to learn how to meditate and and trying to look at how we evolve in in our happiness, in our journey. And a lot of it is around the people that you surround yourself with, who are good and who are giving back and who are empowering other people. And I truly believe that this this COVID experience will have a rising, a rising of people who are empowered to empower other people to think differently, to act differently, to be kinder. And mm. I think kindness is underrated for it its is. value to society. And I think having had this beautiful chat to you, Suzanne, this, I, I have had a lesson in kindness and I can oh. really, really, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful that I've had this and so nice to share with you, Dr. Benson, because I love, I love being with you anyway. Yes. And uh, it's very, very interesting that you mentioned about kindness because uh, one of the earliest lessons that I learned as a young adult is that when in doubt, it is never wrong to live with, kind, to live with kindness. Absolutely. Um, Susan, where can we find your books? I know that they're published by um, publishers, but you can also, can you get them on your website? Well, you can contact me on the website and I can direct you, but the book should be available in bookshops, certainly online. But if you have any trouble, just email me. I've got a new book coming out next year. It was due this year, but because of COVID, um, my publishers said, we're going to delay it a year. And I said, okay. If that's the worst thing that should happen to me, I consider myself very lucky. <laughs> You've written many books. Well, you I... should you should consider yourself very lucky, not because everything that you do is amazing, which it is. It is because I think you are doing the one thing that many of us would probably would like to do, but probably wouldn't be able to do in terms of you are literally talking to millions of people you are the best friend of millions of kids and you are getting them through tough times and they're probably celebrating good times reading your books too exactly and then it matters to me it matters to me i just don't want to see i just don't want to see kids lost 
So the the, the books the, you did, you've written lots of them, and obviously, but the the I am Jack um, books, which are based on your child, are the ones that are around the bullying and the and the and the and the younger ages. There are a whole lot of other books. Um, your website is. Can you spell it for us? It's S Gervay, my name, G E R V A Y dot com. Really easy to find. If you put Suzanne Gervais, you'll you find go. there's lots. Before we go, um, I just want to say thank you so much. Also, I'm a little bit jealous because I see that you sat on a stage with Oprah Winfrey, who is my dream. My, my dream is to one day be on a stage with her. I don't care if I have to be cleaning the floor around the, t the, the, the sofa, but I mean, that is my ultimate and you have been there and done that. So the, you, you, you become my hero as well. Um, so thank you so much for this incredible special interview. Thank you, Dr. Vincent. And we will be back with another Living Out Loud interview um, soon. Hopefully, I think they've all got a lot to live up to after this one, but thank you so much.